streaming. So now this is the part two of today's lecture. So part two of today's lecture um, is starting with a new module. See, it just magically reappeared you know, when, while you guys took the break. <laughs> For those of you who are curious of you know, how many modules can I potentially link to Canvas at any particular time, you can uh, go to this URL, okay? I know you cannot really read you know, this URL while you're in class or write it down, you know, read it quickly. But remember, it's on YouTube. Freeze the frame on YouTube, zoom in, and you can now you know, get to the URL of all the modules that I have written so far, which is 300 and something, okay? Not many are related to this class, so you might want to wait until I link them to this class. But if you're curious, you can always just go there and go like, okay, let me see what else you know, Tech has written for classes. Not necessarily this one. There we go. So we go back to the course and now we have this topic called nested control structure. So let's go ahead and take a look at this module, which I haven't really reformatted for a long time. We'll see how long. I must have re recently reformatted that because it looks relatively, no, this is really old. It's is an old format. Okay. Um, I just clicked the wrong button. No. Where is it? Here. All right. So here's the why. So the, 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 the question is asking, why do we have nested statements? Okay, that's what it's asking. To answer the question, you know, and to, to answer the question in a way that you will probably walk away and really remember it, is to look at a map. Okay, so we looked at the map. Best place is to look at maps.google.com, okay? And then we want to zoom out. Okay, where's my zoom control? Oh, it's just really slow. Like really, really slow. Okay. Come on. Zoom, 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 zoom. Oh, come on. All right. <laughs> that's fine. That is. That's that's okay. Not a problem. Okay. So pretending that we don't have that spot, you know, saying where we are right now. Okay. The question is, where where is Sacramento? Where's Carmichael? Where, where's Watt Avenue? We can't see it. Why can't we see it? We're too far away, okay? So we have to zoom in to see something, okay? Where's California? You know, can, can you, from this map here, okay, from the globe view, can you tell California apart from Oregon and Arizona and Nevada? I mean, at this level, that's pretty difficult, okay? That's pretty difficult. But you can kind of tell, okay, United States is, the United States is here, Canada is over here, Mexico is over here. So at a very global level, we can see countries, okay, in a particular continent. So now we zoom in, okay, zoom in a little bit more. Now we get to see the states a whole lot better, okay? We can now see, um, San Francisco, we can see the states, we can see Nevada, Oregon, um, Arizona, we can see uh, Washington, and so on and so forth. So we gain a level of details by zooming in a little bit, okay? But I still cannot see Carmichael. I still cannot see Watt Avenue. I cannot see Walnut Avenue, okay? So, so why not? <coughs> Okay, so you, you might say, okay, but tech, you know, this projector is only XGA resolution. There's only so many dots you know, on the screen. Okay, so in your mind, just kind of imagine that we have a magical projector that has infinite resolution. We can project dots as small as we want. Okay, so that's no longer a limitation. Would that be a good idea? Even if the technology is capable of displaying what avenue on this map here. Why not? Right. So the question now is, how many things can you keep track of when you're looking at, say, a map or you know, some text or you know, a sentence? 
how many things can your brain really keep track of in the short term? Okay, I just need an order of magnitude, okay? <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll just n mention order of magnitude here. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go 5, 50, 500, and 5,000. What is it? Five. 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 Very good. Okay. So our brain cannot handle a lot of details all at the same time. We can handle about five things. We can relate those five things to you really well, but if it becomes 50, then we go like, oh man, I cannot re really keep track of all, the, all that stuff anymore, okay? So it's the same thing with a map, okay? You guys are really lucky that we have maps that do this, okay? We can zoom in and then we see a little bit more details. We zoom in and we see a little bit more and so on, okay? People of my age, okay? When we started you know, to learn how to drive, we did not have Google Map. We did not even have Gar. You know, what is the name of that GPS company? Garmin, Garmin and also there's one more, right? Magellan, okay? We don't have those. So you might ask, so old folks, what do you do when you need to go to a new place that you have never been before when you don't have GPS? We use maps, okay? Then you go like, oh, we know maps. This is a map, you know, it's not that hard to use. You just click enter where you want to go, and then you enter where you are, it plots, and it even tells you verbally where to make a turn. So what is so hard about using a map? Well, we are talking about map that has all the, so you, we have a map about this big, okay? Try to drive and flip through that map at the same time. That by itself is a, is a driving hazard, okay? And then you have font that is like this small because it has to describe every single street name on that map, <laughs> okay? So you have basically hundreds of street names and names of places and stuff like that on a, on a big piece of paper about this big. And your job is to find out, oh, where's my destination again? Oh, it's right here. And where are we starting? It's about here. Um, how do I get from here to here? So your brain actually has to manually figure out what street you need to take you know, what side street you need to take, and then make what turn, you have to track the entire thing. But the difficulty has to do with the map has too much stuff on it. It is impossible or very difficult to find something when you have hundreds of names on it. And that's why those maps have an index on the back that is alphabetically ordered. So Walnut Avenue, okay, it will, it will have a little entry at the back, and it will tell you what squares on the map you know, has that street on it. So it gives you a range instead of one single square because you know, Walnut is a pretty long street. So it gives you a range and say, oh, you know, squares, you know, C6 to C13, you know, has what, I mean, uh, Walnut on it. But then, you know, in those particular squares, you still have to look for Walnut, <laughs> okay? It's not obvious, it doesn't highlight it, okay? All right, but I think we get the idea of, you know, why of the limitation. We can only focus on a few things at the same time. That's why we have nesting. That is also why in your you know, file folders, you have folders in folders in folders. Is that making any sense? Because you know, if you have a folder with a thousand entries, it becomes almost impossible to find one thing within the thousands of entries. So you will need to find a way so that each folder contains a limited number of subfolders. Each subfolder contains a limited number of subfolders, let's say 10 to 20, okay? And then the last one now contains actual files. But you don't want to put hundreds of files into the last folder. You also want to only have maybe 10, 20, maybe 50 files in a folder. Is that making any sense? Okay, so that is the reason why we have nested control structure because we just cannot handle all the details all at the same time. All right, so let's go to the notes here. So we're done with the why, okay? You know, the reason why we have um, nested control structures. So now we have an example, okay? Something like this. Does that look familiar to you? Yeah. It should, because we, we just saw this earlier, except we didn't use five, we used three, okay? So what does this have anything to do with nested control structure? It's already nesting. Because x gets zero is a statement. The while loop itself is a statement too. 
then you say, well, if the while loop, which is going from line two to line four, is already a statement, then what is line three? Line three is also a statement. It's a statement inside another statement. In other words, we have already been using the concept of nesting. It's just that I didn't point it out earlier. Is that okay? Okay. So now the next question, okay, the next slide, is going to a slightly more complex example. So now we have something that looks like this. Trust me, this is not even close to actually complex, okay? So now we have a loop inside another loop. The bigger question now is, so what do we do on line seven, okay? What do we do on line five? What do we do on line three? And what do we do on line nine? Those are the key points to ask questions because now we say, well, at the end, when, when the condition of line five is false, where do we go? Well, we have to go to the end of one loop, but which loop are we going, which, the end of which loop are we going in this case? Um, when, after line seven, where do we go? We know that after line seven, we have to go back to the beginning of a loop to reevaluate a condition, but which condition are we reevaluating? Because we have two loops here, um, after line nine, where do we go? Well, line nine is the last thing of a particular you know, loop, so we have to go back to the beginning to reevaluate the condition. Which one are we talking about? So when you look at something like this, the best thing you can do is to draw a picture to represent the logic, okay? If this is the first time you see a nested loop, you can draw a picture. But wait, you don't have to draw that picture because I have that picture drawn already. <laughs> It looks like this, okay? <laughs> so let me zoom out a little bit so that you can get the overall picture. I know you're gonna lose some details, but you know. Okay, zoom out one more level, there we go. Okay, so this is the overall picture of the nested loop that was presented earlier. Are you guys now convinced that pictorial programming is really not the way to go? <laughs> Do you, do, you, do you know how much time it takes for me to draw a picture like this? <laughs> but what we want to see is, see this darker thing here? You can kind of look at it as one thing, one statement, okay? So that becomes a part of the larger loop here, okay? Is that okay? So let's go ahead and trace this program, okay? Because as we trace this program, there will be certain decision points where we have to say, well, we are at the end of a loop, but where do we go you know, to reevaluate the condition? Which condition should we reevaluate? Okay, so that's what we're gonna do now. If you continue with this you know, slide here, the, the, the trace or a partial trace is already done here. I'm not gonna read out the partial trace because that will bore me to tears and you don't want to see that. So what we'll do instead is we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the pseudocode and then we'll perform this trace on the side and then we'll you know, talk about the concepts of you know, how to trace through something like that. So I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna use this particular window. Just put it a little bit to the side and then we start formatting the trace first. Line number, usual, comments, as usual. So now we have to look at this and go like, okay, how many columns do we need for the variables? We have variable X, variable S, variable Y. So there are three variables that I can see, okay? So we say there's variable S, X, and Y. And we can shrink these columns a little bit because they don't really need to take up this much space, okay? Comments, on the other hand, well, I think that we should be fine here. Line number doesn't need that much space, so we'll shrink it a little bit. There we go. And I can go back here and magnify this a little bit because I think people in the back may not be see it, may not be able to see it very well. So we'll make it a little bit bigger. And now we can do the trace on one side while we can keep an eye on the pseudocode. So here's the precondition. 
what do you think the precondition should be for the variables? Just based on what you can see you know, right now. They can all be question marks because it doesn't really matter what value they start off with because the first thing we do to each of the variables is to overwrite it with a constant. So it doesn't really matter what you start, what they start off with. So if it doesn't really matter, we better say you know, they, it does not matter. So we use a question mark to basically indicate it doesn't really matter what they start off with because the first thing we do is we're going to overwrite them. So here's line one, okay, easy peasy, okay, x gets initialized to zero. Here's line two, um, s is initialized to zero here, and here is line three, uh, the condition of x is less than three is true, okay, very good. And then, and then where do we go? What is the beginning of the code that is inside that particular loop? Line four, okay, so line four is, that, that one is pretty easy. So line four is initializing y to zero. So here's y you know, being initialized to zero. And then we continue onto line five. That's also without much question. Y is less than two is also true at this point. So we keep going in you know, to the nested you know, structure. We go to line six, y gets y plus one. So y is now one. And then we go to line seven, um, s is what it has and then plus x plus y basically. So we add up all three variables to become the new value of s. Okay? Now, as lazy as I am, I'm not going to go through the calculation myself. Okay? Because I'm really, really, really bad at arithmetic. Okay? And you might ask, but you teach computer science. How can you be bad at arithmetic? That's exactly why. Because I have computers to do all the arithmetic operations for me. Okay? So I would use this function. It's really, really cool. Because what you do is you just used to say, oh, whatever s is right now plus whatever x has right now plus whatever y has right now. Enter. Done. <laughs> That's how you use a spreadsheet. Because a spreadsheet, the, the, the magic of a spreadsheet is there's an equation. So if you look up to the what, it, what we call the equation bar or the formula bar here, this is how we calculate the value of the cell that we know as C9, okay? So the cell C9 is the sum of the cell C4, D3, and E8. I don't have to do the calculation myself, okay? I just have to refer to, oh, okay, just add up those three numbers and that will be the answer of this cell. Now, you don't have to learn how to use a spreadsheet in this class. This is not a spreadsheet class, okay? But if you think about it, if you're learning how to specify algorithms, you're trying to understand how computers work, knowing how to work with a spreadsheet is going to be really helpful, okay? Even though it's not required. All right, so, but, but here's the big question. This is the end of the body of a loop which means it is time for me to go back and reevaluate a condition. But now I have two conditions that I can potentially be reevaluating because I can go to line five or I can go back to line three because they, those two are both the beginning of a loop. Which one should I go back to? We should go back to line five. Why? Mm, yes. So there are several reasons why. The first one is if you look at while as open parentheses and end while as closed parentheses, and this is all nested, the, the matching open parentheses of a close is the one that is closest to it. So that is why. So the one thing you, you, ha you want to remember is every time you see while, it look at it as an open parentheses. When you see an end while, it is a closed parenthesis. So you have to pair up those things in the usual way that you express, you know, you use in expressions. So that means now we go back to line five. Line five is just reevaluating y is less than two. It is still true. So we we go back to line six. Line six is just adding one to y. Y goes from one to two. And then we go to line seven again. 
So this time your line seven, once again, I use that trick, is whatever itself has from before, plus wh whatever x has, which hasn't changed, and whatever y has. Whoops, uh, okay, I have to, I, I pressed the backspace key accidentally. Click this one, plus, and then two is over here. Press the enter key, we got the calculations done. And then we go back to line five again. So we go back to line five. The question is, is y less than two? Well, what do you think? False. It is false. Okay. So when, when it is false, now where do we go? Because we have two spots that are after and while. Because we got line nine that is after and while, which means it is right after the loop, a loop. And then we also have line 11, which is also right after a loop. So we know that when the condition of a while loop is false, we get out of the loop, we continue with whatever is after the loop. But now where do we go? We do not go to line three yet, okay? Because what we got one thing after the inner loop. <coughs> what is that? Line nine. Line nine is right after the nested loop. Because when you get out of a loop, you continue with whatever is right after the loop. Which loop are we getting out of? Is what we call the inner loop. The inner loop is referring to line five to line eight. So when we get out of that inner loop, whatever is after the inner loop is whatever we need to continue to, 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 uh, to execute. So in this case, it is line nine that we have to continue to execute. Now, line nine itself is easy, okay? The difficult part is to understand that we have to continue with line nine when the condition of line five is false. That is the trick, okay? So we are now on line nine, and line nine is just adding one to x. x goes from zero to one, and now we go to, now where do we go? We are now once again at the end of the body of a loop, so what is the beginning, the matching beginning of the end while of line 10? Line three, okay, line three is the one. So we go back to line three, and then line three is asking, is x less than three? It is still true because x now has a value of one, and now it becomes difficult to find out, oh, but which column is x, which column is y, which column is s? So here's another feature of most spreadsheets that is really handy. So I'm gonna show you guys how to use that particular feature. Um, well, I guess I don't have to do it that way. Okay, so there's there's one particular thing you can do with a spreadsheet. Um, okay, different spreadsheets have a different control. There's a little thing here, okay? See how the mouse pointer changes its shape into an up, down arrow thing here? It can drag this. So you can drag this down, and what happens is, is it, it's breaking up the spreadsheet into two panes where each pane can be scrolled independently. Okay, so let me show you the magic of this thing. And it's really helpful for teaching this class. So I go to this pane here, and I you know, just use down arrow. You can see how I can now down arrow with the lower pane without changing the display of the upper pane. So this means I can continue to display the header of each column while I keep going on you know, with the rest of the spreadsheet. Okay, it's a really handy feature that you may not find useful because you're gonna use, I mean, hopefully your computer is not having an XGA display like mine. <laughs> How many people have a computer this old with an XGA display? No one, okay, very good. Your cell phone has higher resolution than my computer. <laughs> your Fitbit may have a higher re resolution than my computer, yes? Which year again? Uh, in, in year 2000. That may not have HDMI at all. I think that's, that's VGA. Yeah, that's way before. Yep. Uh -huh. Okay, so we are now back on line three, um, and then we go back to line four, and then line four is just reinitializing y to zero. So y already has a value of two at this point but I'm reinitializing that to zero. We proceed to line five, 
we ask the question y is less than 2 is true at this point because y now has a value of 2. And then we go to line 6. You can see how this is going to be a pretty long and tedious trace, right? Okay, so we go to line 7 again. So line 7 is going to update s. So once again, I'm going to use that trick. It is whatever it has plus whatever y has and then plus whatever x has. So this way I don't have to do my own math. And then we go back to line 5. And line 5 is asking the same question. y is less than 2 is true because y has a value of 1 at this point. Now it is 2. Now, the other thing that is important is even though, whoops, I, I need to do it on a separate line. Okay, there we go. So the other important thing that to notice is once you get past line 5, now we are on line 6. So once you get past line 5, even though y is now 2, it is no longer less than 2, we don't get out of the loop. You only get a chance to get out of the loop when execution is going back to line 5. If you're not going back to line 5, you cannot exit the loop. You have to keep going until you get back to line 5. Is that okay? Okay. So this is on line 6. And then on line 7, we do something like before. It is whatever S has plus whatever X has plus whatever Y has, like so. And we go back to line 5. And you can see how this trace is not really that interesting once we know how to proceed at the end of one loop or at the beginning of a loop. So, we, so this time we get out of the loop because y is less than 2 is finally false. And once again, the important part is we continue on to line 9. Okay. So uh, do we have any questions about the trace at this point? When does x become 1? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Well, this is the row that makes, e that makes x equal to 1. It is on line 9, but it was a while back. But why? Why do you think um, executing line 9 of row 14 of the trace is putting a 1 into x? What happened? when we executed line 9 at that time. So this is, the, this is the good part about tracing a program like this. Because what you can do is you can roll back the tape, so to speak. So when we execute line 9 on row 14, at that time, x had a value of 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. So when we, then we use 1 to update variable x. That was why variable x was updated to 1. Remember what I said? If you take a slice, you know, when you take a roll in a trace, it represents a slice of time. In other words, if you look at a slice of time, I should be able to know what is the value of s at that particular point. What was it? 3. What is the value of, what was the value of y when we update x to 1 on line 9? y had the value of 2. In other words, if you just take one single roll, of the trace, you get a snapshot of the value of every single variable at that particular point in, point in time. And this is a really kind of visual way of looking at the execution of a program. What if you take a column? What, what, what does it represent when you say, oh, okay, we want, I want to take a look at column D. What is it representing? It is representing the entire history of how variable x changes over time. Is that okay? It's kind of a, you know, I find it to be kind of visual and useful when we need to visualize, you know, how we are changing variables as we execute a program. But this is this may be the only class, you know, where you get this kind of visual representation of how things got changed when you execute an algorithm. In your other classes, you don't have you know, traces to perform. You write your code, you run your code on a computer, and there's no easy way to keep track of the values of variables in your other classes. Are we doing okay so far?
with nested control structures. You doing okay? All right. So let's go back to the slides and see what else is here. Okay, this the next you know, part you know, is talking about how to interpret nested statements. So it points out the, all the important points that I have already pointed out. So there's nothing new on this particular you know, slide here um, because all the important lines is already discussed as we talk about the trace. Okay. So for the most part, you know, this is really just a repetition in written form of what I just said. Are we good so far? Good. All right. So the next slide is pre and post conditions. This is a slide where some people would totally hate. <laughs> so be warned. And this has, oh, this is already you know, kind of modern enough. So the last time I touched this was 2012, <laughs> about uh, six years and a half ago. Yep, that's right. <laughs> I haven't taught this class for six years and a half. And to make it worse, the first you know, section talks about what is this crazy math? Did you sign up for a math class? Or did you sign up for computer science class? Or did you sign up for both? What do you think? <laughs> well, it depends on how you want to look at it, okay? So this particular thing, you know, I, I can read this out, you know, but you can also just read it by yourself later on. But there are two computer scientists you know, of you know, really significance you know, with, uh, modern, with modern computer science. The first one is Donald, not Trump, Knuth. There we go. My favorite Donald. <laughs> okay, so he doesn't look like much. I mean, it you know, doesn't look very, you know, but he is, um, at this point, he is teaching at Stanford. He has been teaching at Stanford for a long time, okay? So you can kind of, how many people, how many people does not know what is Stanford University? Very good. We all know what is Stanford University. <laughs> okay, so what do you think is, a, is the qualification to teach, not even as a student, to teach at Stanford University? You have to, pre you have to be pretty good, okay? You have to be pretty good. And, you know, he is, he's pretty good, okay? This guy is, is really good. Um, and he has a particular view of, you know, what it takes to become a computer scientist, or even to become a programmer, to become a developer, a coder, okay? So he's one. The other one is Dijkstra, D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A, okay, Dijkstra. And this is the other guy, you know, who is another person who is really significant in modern computer science. He passed away, you know, many years ago. Okay, let me check when he passed away. So this guy passed away in 2002, so that picture was pretty much, you know, in the same year that he passed away. They held different views of, you know, how mathematics and computer science are related. This guy, Dijkstra, he said, you know, well, in order to become a computer scientist, in order to become a coder, in order to become a computer engineer, you have to be first a mathematician. In other words, computer science is a branch of mathematics. That's what he, that's his view. Donald Knuth, you know, has a slightly different view. Donald you know, Knuth, you know, basically believes that with the advancement of development tools, okay, um, more people can become coders and developers uh, without becoming a mathematician first. So they have, you know, slightly different views. So now the question is, from your perspective, what, what does it matter, okay? Why do I care whether I want to be a mathematician first before I become a programmer? Now this ties into what you, you mentioned last week you know, about those uh, boot camp classes, okay? So let's, let's take a quick look at that, okay? So we, we'll take a look at boot 
camp, you know, in the Bay Area, okay, so say, you know, San Jose, okay. And there are, well, there are, yeah, I know. Okay, coding. Coding boot camps, part-time, full-time classes. Okay. Okay, maybe I would just ask an easy question. How much? How much? There we go. And do we have a quick answer here? 16 week, you know, coding boot camp, future proof your career. Did they mention the price up front? Huh? 3,000? 10,000. Okay, that sounds about right. But that's not even the most expensive. Did you mention something about 28,000 for eight weeks? Yep. App Academy? Well, okay. The other view to look at that is you owe them until you find a job. <laughs> it's not like you don't pay them, you just owe them until you get a job. So, so what is the context of all of this stuff? What do you think mathematics or the good understanding of mathematics has anything to do with programming? First of all, are they related? And then second of all, if they are related, how are they related? And three, how is that going to impact you? You know, because we are in this class for a reason. We have a few people who are in engineering, but we know that engineering has to make use of a lot of programming. The rest of the class are all kind of on a track to get a computer science degree. Hopefully, okay, how many people are here just to get a computer science degree and then move on and do something that has nothing to do with computer science? Okay, but you're, you're you're different major, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there are very few people. Okay, so most people here are here because you want to pursue a career, you know, in computer science or something that is related to computers. So now the question is, what does math have anything do to do with my job security? What do you think? Yep. Or how is how is a good understanding of math going to help you in your career? Um, well, I mean, computers basically a giant calculator. Yes. And how it works, right? right? Okay. So from a very practical standpoint, okay, from a very practical standpoint, what is what do you think you'll be doing? after you get your bachelor's degree or master's degree or even PhD, what do you think you'll be doing? Sorry? Let's hope that is not the case, right? So in the ideal case, what do you think you'll be doing? Did anyone go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and actually look up those careers and find out what they actually do? Okay, so go ahead. What is your dream job? What do you think you'll be doing in your dream job? In my case, I'm thinking to go into database management. Okay, so what, do we, what are you going to do with database management? Mm, like day to day. Yeah, kind of day to day, you know, like, you know, what is on your, on your list of things to do on a daily, daily basis. Making sure the business works correctly and process correctly. Okay. For people to work on the business. Okay. So how do you qualify whether something is done correctly? whether the database is intact or not, and how do you validate your know, database, your know, queries? <coughs> because you can, you can write a query, but is the query answering the question that somebody else is asking? You know, your ad hoc query has to answer that question. How do you verify that is the case? How do you ver verify that your query is actually correct? Well, that's math in it, yeah. okay? Your relational database is actually pretty uh, math intensive by itself, okay? Does anyone want to develop programs like game programming? Which sounds really exciting, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Most people coming from the gaming industry, you know, really does not like that job, you know, because it's basically a sweatshop. Okay? So it's a good place to launch, but not a good place to continue for too long. Yep. 
Um, they're basically the same thing, you know. So programmer, coder, developer, they're all pretty much the same thing. Yep. So what do you do as a, as a developer? What do you think, you know, in your dream job as a developer, what do you think you'll be doing? Exactly. So you're realistic, okay? You understand the whole thing about fixing bugs. Because when people think about programming and coding, they think, oh, I'll be writing code the whole day. No, you'll be writing about 10 lines of code each day and then fixing a lot of problems along the way. <laughs> okay? So that means you're not writing a lot of new things, you'll be fixing a lot of old things. Um, okay, so fixing old programs, and uh, old you know, logic and stuff like that. What does that have anything to do with mathematics? How do you fix a program? How do you know a program is doing something it's not supposed to? <laughs> that might be okay with some applications, but you know you may not want to do that to let's say a pacemaker or a <laughs> or a nuclear plant control system okay so how do you find out that there's a problem to begin with the program crashes it has an output that is unexpected that sort of thing right so let's say you have a bug report coming in and say okay this app okay whatever app it is okay it's not running and this is the symptom, okay? It just stops working whenever I do blah, 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 okay? So as a developer, what are you gonna do about that? Yep, go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 Th this is even before that, okay? So, so you have a symptom showing up, okay? So what do you do first? You have to go to the source code of the program and find out what is related to the symptom. In other words, you want to find out the, the exact lines that is leading to the symptom directly, because that is going to be your starting point. And then what do you do? You have to execute the program backwards, because the source of the problem is not after the line that is showing the symptoms of a problem. The line that has a problem is before that. How do you execute a how do you execute a program backwards? You go back You have to logic exactly. So you have to use logic and say, well, after we increment x now has a value of four, what do you think is the value of x before the increment? Three, right? So you, now you have one line earlier than before. And then you have to keep going like this for all the variables until hopefully you find the problem and go like, oh, right here, I'm supposed to exit the loop earlier, but I didn't exit the loop earlier because the condition is wrong, okay? That is how you find problems in the program, okay? You basically have to analyze the code, try to execute backwards. Now, there are very occasionally, not occasionally, there are many times where you can execute a program backwards a few lines or a few you know, chunk of, chunks of code, and then you hit, a de you, you hit uh, what we call a dead end, okay? You hit a dead end because there are multiple reasons why you can end up there. Then what do you do? You have to design experiments and say, well, okay, it can be because of this, because of this, or because of this. Then you have to use test cases to figure out which one is exactly the cause that is you know, leading you to the point where the program is crashing. So once again, those are all math. You're applying mathematics. You're applying logic to debug a program. And debugging turns out to be the majority of the things that you'll be doing as a developer. So the term developer is actually a misnomer. What is a misnomer? M-I-S-N-O-M-E-R? Hmm? As a misleading term, exactly. So the term developer is actually very misleading. They should have just called it debugger. <laughs> because you're, most of the time you're debugging, you're not actually developing. Code huh? Code janitor? Code janitor? I wouldn't say it's janitor because it is, it's not something that you can just do, it's not just a chore. Okay, it's not just, oh, I have to go like that, like this. It's more like, it, it's more like playing detective. Okay, you think 
Sherlock. He would make a very good debugger because he can take clues and then you know, use logic and then go backwards to find out what caused a problem. Okay? So he would be a very good example of what a coder or what a developer would be. So going back to here, okay, what does math have anything to do with this? What, what do you think math classes are training you for? Problem solving, I like that. Okay, problem solving, that is it. Okay, so as a coder, you, are, you really need a lot of problem solving skills. Starting with not blowing up or getting angry when your program doesn't work the way it's supposed to. <laughs> okay, so now we can kind of proceed with this slide, you know, with this module here, having you know, mentally prepared you guys for what is to come. So let me, let me close the tabs that I, need, that I don't need anymore. Okay, that I don't need anymore. Okay, so this whole slide basically just talks about that, but the bottom line is if you're not good with math or somebody who's not good with math can still be a programmer, can still be a coder, but someone who has a strong math background, who has, who's analytical and, ha and also has problem solving skills, would make a better developer, okay? So what is the difference between a developer versus a better developer? Job security. I would, I would take the civic, thank you. <laughs> because I can only pay the insurance for a civic. <laughs> Yeah, my Civic has an insurance of about uh, $300 you know, for half a year, as opposed to some of my other cars, which are more expensive. Yeah, the Civic is as basically as inexpensive as it gets when it, gets to, when it comes to insurance. Yeah. Well, my Ranger is pretty expensive. Your what? My Ranger is pretty expensive. Your Ranger? My Ford Ranger. Do you know why? Mm -hmm. No, Rangers are not really big trucks. I mean, they're, they're, they're really tiny compared to any trucks today. Okay, so I, I got to digress a little bit. I know you guys don't like me digressing, but I, have to, I you know, when it gets to this, I have to I talk about it. Yeah. Um, I, I got into an accident uh, with a cyclist. So I was driving 40 miles per hour down Eastern, and then here comes the bicycle coming out from the side street, not even slowing down, okay? So I got maybe half a second to apply the brakes, and then bam! you know, slam onto the, uh, the, the, the bicycle, the cyclist. And then, my, and then right at that moment, I couldn't see out anymore because my windshield, you know, let's say my windshield was originally this far away, it became like this, okay? So after the accident, I ended up with shards of glass on my forearm sticking out vertically like that, okay? So it was, so there was enough kinetic energy to shoot shards of glass from my windshield onto my forearm so that it is standing up vertically, okay? So I thought, you know, the, wh whoever I hit, you know, has to be dead, okay, in a, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pool of blood about half a block away. No, no, when I got, when I finally got out of the car really carefully because I couldn't see, you know, where I'm going, so I kind of have to pull over slowly and then step out, step out of the car, that kid was sitting on the side crying and begging his friend not to call his mom because he was afraid that his mom would be mad that he just wrecked the bike. <laughs> and that was right after a 40 mile per hour you know, collision with a car. So the question is, what saved his life? Okay, I was driving my Civic at the time, so what happened was the, my license plate hit the crankshaft on his bike, so it did not even touch him directly. And then he fell onto my hood and left a really big skid mark on my hood, okay? And then slammed onto the windshield. What is the softest part of a car that, that can give, you know, absorb the most amount of energy? The windshield. <laughs> so he hit the windshield with enough energy that it bucked my A-pillar. Do you know what is an A-pillar? The A-pillar is the one that is holding up the, the windshield. So the top of my A-pillar bucked because of the collision. 
Yeah, so he was sitting on the side, of course, you know, when the firemen came, they also go like, okay, please lay down, and then they, 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 they just kind of you know, use a stretcher to carry him away. Um, I read the police report afterwards. Um, so that kid who weighs 220 pounds basically walked away with a fractured shoulder. I am so sorry that he cannot be a quarterback anymore, but I'm very glad that he's still alive. And, and having a car like the Civic saved his life. His mom later on showed up with a, uh, with a Suburban. If it was her mom and involved in the same accident at the same speed, he would have been dead. Because I walked up to, now I'm particularly short, but I'm not that short, okay? <laughs> so when I walk up to a Suburban, the bumper starts at my kneecap. The, the grill, you know, the front grill of the car ends about here. So in a 40 mile per hour collision with a vehicle like that, and the front is for the most part flat, right? So there's nothing to fall on and then slide and then you know, absorb the energy. So I would be totally dead at 40 miles per hour. Even 20 miles per hour would probably even kill a person, you know, with a car like that. So that is why. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? <laughs> but any truck has a flatter, you know, front end, so it's not going to be as uh, passing. I mean, uh, pedestrian friendly. It a lot of that has to do with statistics too. So they can they can have a car that should not be, you know, uh, diffi uh, expensive to insure, but because of statistics, you know, they just know that you know by statistics, you know, this car is likely to get into a costly accident. And that's how they you know, set up the premiums. Yep. Not enough power. Hmm? Not enough power to get away from the accident. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, being huh? Well, it was actually the cyclist's fault. Okay. The car behind me also pulled over and told the policeman that you know, uh, he told the policeman that I could not have done anything at that time because there's there's just no time to respond. Um, and then the cyclist also had his friends uh, telling the cops and say, he did not even look, he just you know, went out to the intersection. <laughs> of course, that didn't help much, you know. Yeah, but it was scary for sure. It was scary. I was so concerned about you know, the, the, you know, the, the kid you know, being dead or severely injured. So a fractured shoulder, I can live with that. <laughs> yep. Okay. So. The new topic here is pre and post condition, and obviously we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about pre and post condition. But the if, but the point of the pre and post condition analysis is so that we can execute the program backwards, or we can prove that an algorithm is correct. So I can talk about the main concepts that you will need to that we are trying to accomplish with this particular module. Okay, so what I want to do now is to bring back some code that we have written before. So I'm hoping you guys still remember this code. If x is greater than y, then z gets x, um, else z gets y, and if. Do you guys remember this code? It finds the maximum of x and y and then store the maximum in z. Okay? We, we did this before. So now the question is, how do I know this code is correct? Well, we can throw some test, case, test cases to it, which, 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 which we did, okay? What if x is 0 and y is 1, okay? You know, z is 1, so it seems to be correct. Uh, what if x is negative 5 and y is 2? Well, then z is going to be 2, okay? That seems to be right, and so on. So we can throw as many test cases as we want to this particular pseudocode, or even you know, to run it as an actual program on a computer. But what makes you think the next test case is not going to fail? We cannot know. Okay, you know we can. We have a pretty good feeling that you know, it will continue to work, but there's no guarantee that the next test is not going to you know expose the program and go like, oh, it's actually wrong. So now, how do we know that a particular piece of code is actually right, like all the time? Well, we can try to mathematically prove it. So that's one of the reasons why we study pre and post condition, is so that we have some of the tools that we need to analyze pseudocode using mathematics 
and then be able to prove the correctness of pseudocode once and for all. You don't need test cases anymore because we can mathematically and conclusively prove that that piece of code does what it is supposed to. Okay, so that's one huge motivation of understanding what is pre and post condition. The other one is to debug a program. If, a, if this is the condition at this line, can I work my way back to figure out what is the condition up here? Because that is going to be useful in the process of debugging. Is that okay so far? So getting back to here, now the question is, what exactly is the maximum of two variables? Okay, if I say that z is the maximum of x and y, what does that really mean? Okay, so we'll use the next uh, five minutes to, this, to, to talk about this. So some people would say, oh, that's easy. If z is, if, if z is the maximum of x and y, that means x, z is greater than or equal to x, and z is greater than or equal to y. Okay, that seems pretty reasonable as, uh, as a condition or as an explanation of what is maximum. Is that okay? But I'll tell you it's wrong, okay? Because what if I have this scenario? Um, X has a value of two, Y has a value of six, and Z has a value of 200. Is 200 the maximum of six and two? No, but does it meet this requirement? Is 200 greater than or equal to X? Yes. Is 200 greater than or equal to y? Yes. We're missing something here. What, what am I missing? Yep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, it has to equal to one of them. So this part is true, okay? We need that much. But we also need one more. Because we also have to say that z has to equal to x or z has to equal to y. It has to be one of the two. Because otherwise, 200 does meet that requirement when x equals to two and y equals to six. But by placing this extra requirement that one of these two, at least one of these two, has to be the same as z, now we actually define what is the maximum of two numbers. Is that okay? But this is something that is also very important because until we know how to express what it means to be, to take the maximum of two values, we cannot check it because we cannot mathematically prove that the result of this particular algorithm is exactly this condition. So that's what we want to do. So next class on Friday, and possibly maybe on Monday next week, we'll be focusing on, but how do we do this? How do we prove, <clears throat> how do we prove this code here is going to guarantee the post condition of the entire thing to be like this, regardless of what the values of X and Y are? Yes, because if we only have z equals x or z equals y, then I can say I can claim the maximum is 2, and it will still meet that requirement. Yeah, so we need both of those. We need to say that it's at least as big as both of them, but at the same time, it has to equal to at least one of them. So we need both of those conditions. So we'll go ahead and talk about this next, uh, next class on Friday. So your job is to read ahead of me, okay? This is a difficult module to dig through, but still, you know, try to dig through as much as you can so that on Friday, you know, I can make the assumption that you have read it already, and then we can hopefully move a little bit faster, okay? So I have more time to digress. Do you want to another hands-on? I like those a lot. Okay, we'll do, we'll, we'll do it, okay? Mm -hmm.